uh, the current presentation. Yeah. All right. But um, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, Helio Obermassen, who is the third person in this European American Collaboration on Wind Energy uh, webinar series. I would say next month we, we don't have a speaker yet, but then in January we have uh, uh, Elliot Simon, who speaks about the globe experiment in the North Sea. Uh, and um, but so it's every uh, it's the second Wednesday of every month we have these seminars. Anyway, uh, Dr. Elia Ogor Massen has a PhD from Aalborg University working on actuator cylinder models for vertical axis wind turbines. He has been at DTU his whole career and before 2010. It was called Riso National Lab, and which was then joined into DTU. And he has been working on engineering model of aer turbine aerodynamics, wake flow, and he has contributed uh, to the beam element method uh, models uh, implemented in uh, DTU's aeroelastic code called Hawk 2. He has worked on near wake model and dynamic wake meandering model. He has also uh, been very active in experimental aerodynamics. Uh, he has led the Dan Aero uh, experiment in 2009, and he has developed uh, an add-on uh, to large wind turbine blades to measure uh, pressure around a, a, a wind turbine blade. He has also been very uh, pioneering in developing a uh, flap technology for, for large wind turbine blades starting in 2009, and they are now tested on, on very large turbines. He has also been leading a project called Low Wind, exploring the possibilities of having wind turbines uh, rotors with very low specific uh, power. Um, he has authored or co-authored more than 400 uh, publications, uh, 69 of those are in peer review journals. So, so please, uh, Helia, if you can share your screen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jakob. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, it's clear. It's fine. Yeah, but I uh, will share my screen. I'm doing... And let's see. Yeah, so works fine. Can you have it? Do we see it in the, in the presentation mode? We see it in the correct mode, yes. Okay, thank you, Jakob, for this uh, nice uh, introduction, what I've been doing in, in the past. And what I'll present today is uh, mainly what I've been working on uh, during the last uh, year, time to time. Uh, so I'll present uh, the work on developing an, an analytical uh, linear 2D actuator disk model, which could form the basis for a new uh, rotor induction model. And uh, the outline uh, is uh, first uh, a background for this uh, model development, it will be about the uh, blade element momentum model, which we call BEM, and uh, uh, show uh, two or three cases on uh, research on improving uh, BEM for, uh, in particular, uh, cone or non-planar rotors. And then I'll go to this uh, uh, 2D actuator disk uh, model development, the origin of the model, uh, the describing equations and how these are solved, and uh, then uh, show the final uh, analytical uh, solution. Then uh, continue to um, uh, show uh, results for uniform loading, for aligned flow, for a yaw disk, and for a cone disk, and these results I will compare with uh, CFD uh, actuator disk uh, simulations. 
And then uh, uh, a few slides on the numerical implementation in order to simulate an arbitrary disk shape and arbitrary loading. And I will give examples on, on this. And then uh, I think there's one slide on how the model could be implemented uh, as a rotor induction model. And finally, uh, the conclusions. But now to the uh, background, uh, which uh, is the blade element uh, uh, momentum model, which is the core aerodynamic model in most uh, aerodynamic and elastic codes uh, today, and it's both in industry and academia. And I've been always been impressed by BIM, and I think it's incredible that almost the whole fleet today, a uh, wind turbine has been designed with uh, elastic models that uh, have the BIM as the aerodynamic uh, part. <clears throat> And uh, but we see um, uh, that uh, the implementation of the BEM uh, it uh, comprises uh, many sub models, so we see considerable uh, deviations or differences in results from BEM codes when we do benchmarking, as we will see. But uh, although it's performing uh, overall quite well, the BEM, then we see some uh, uh, challenges from the upscaling uh, of the turbines uh, uh, where decreased accuracy of the model uh, and this upscaling is violating some basic assumptions in the model. And for the big rotors, we see a considerable inflow variation over the rotor disk due to turbulence and wind shear. And the model is based on steady uniform inflow. So this, of course, uh, challenges uh, the, the model assumption. And then another important part is that uh, with these uh, flexible blades that the big turbines have now uh, and uh, combined with possible coning, we see quite non-planar uh, rotors uh, with shapes like an umbrella. And this, as we will see also, uh, challenge the, the, the BEM accuracy. And then finally, uh, turbines, they use uh, advanced uh, control, which can be individual pits, or it could be trailing edge flaps. So during a turbine operation, we see big variations, variations of the loading along the blades and between the blades. And uh, this is not straightforward how to handle this in a, a BEM model. But um, uh, we have carried out a, a recent uh, benchmark of uh, both uh, BEM-based codes and uh, higher order codes, uh, uh, free vortex and, uh, and CFD codes in uh, IEA Task 29, uh, and um, where uh, the most common uh, elastic models uh, uh, were included. Uh, it's the bladed and UK or two here from DTU, uh, the code from IFPEN, open fast from NREL, uh, FASAS from uh, TNO, and uh, Polimi, uh, the uh, CPL number code from Polimi. But these are the BEM codes, and then, as I said, uh, uh, a number of uh, higher fidelity codes were uh, used, uh, were also uh, present. And just one example on how this uh, benchmarking uh, results uh, look like. We have over here uh, the normal force, aerodynamic force on the blade at uh, four radial position from inboard to outboard. And we have uh, experimental data from this uh, two megawatt, uh, uh, megawatt turbine uh, from the Daneo experiments, which are the black dots. And then we have uh, BEM results in red, uh, the free weight codes in green, and the CFD in, in blue. And then we show the standard deviation of the results around the, the mean. And we can easily see, for example, here that uh, the BEM code and the different implementation in the codes, it gives a, a big standard deviation on some part of the azimuth. And 
uh, we can also see that the CFD-based simulations, they show the absolute most uh, narrow uh, standard deviation. So, and also are close to the uh, closest to the, uh, the experimental results. Uh, so this uh, benchmark can give a valuable insight in the accuracy of the, these uh, engineering codes. Uh, so the your case is uh, one of the problematic uh, uh, cases to simulate with it. Um, then we uh, have the uh, here the shortcomings uh, of the BEM uh, code uh, uh, when we uh, have non-planner rotors. Uh, in uh, these results from uh, uh, 99 uh, 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 carried out with CFD simulations, uh, we have uh, four different rotor shapes, uh, a straight rotor, one with winglet that combines cone and flexible rotor and uh, a, a 20 degree uh, cone uh, rotor. And the computations with the uh, CFD uh, uh, simulations on these uh, air uh, uh, actuator disks uh, show that the axial velocity at the uh, disk varies uh, uh, along the radius and also differ quite much from uh, the from the different uh, rotor or disk shapes. And we also have here the momentum of BEM theory, which would give a constant uh, induction for uh, for all the rotors, as it does not model any impact of the non-planar uh, rotor disks. And we see that uh, even for a plane rotor, the CFD simulations show uh, a non, uh, 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 yeah, uh, a non-uniform uh, variation, higher, less induction on the inboard part and higher induction on the output part, which we will look into uh, later um, and I must say quite big deviation due to this, uh, these different uh, rotor shapes. And um, there have been different uh, uh, model developments uh, to, to, uh, uh, to improve them uh, for non-planar rotors. And here is the work, uh, two examples from the work of Crawford um, it's uh, a plane disk over here and a 20 degree cone disk. And the CFD simulation from the last slide uh, is included here for comparison with, together with the CFD simulation of Nicholson for uh, comparison with this uh, engineering uh, model. And um, uh, Crawford uh, operates with, uh, uh, with um, on expanding uh, 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 BEM version and then introducing introducing an expanded uh, version and on exp uh, on expanding we see a constant uh, induction but when he includes uh, these improvements uh, taking into account uh, the expansion of the stream tubes which involves that you have to compute the radial velocity uh, then we see these uh, nonlinear uh, uh, induction as function of radius, which fit better with the uh, high fidelity modeling with CFD. And over here, it's uh, then uh, carried out for a 20 degree cone uh, disk, where uh, also you can say, see that the, this uh, improvement of BEM by Crawford, it comes closer to the uh, uh, CFD uh, simulations. But, but as we also will see later, it is. Uh, challenging to do a one point uh, correction of them for, for coning. Uh, another recent uh, uh, improvement, or uh, you could say it's uh, in fact a, a new uh, type of codes, it's a combination of a BEM uh, code and a vortex cylinder codes uh, carried out by my colleagues uh, here at DTU. Um, and they are uh, using a model where they stack the vortex uh, cylinders to model the the the, the cone uh, disk shape or the outer plane disk shape. And uh, this new uh, model has been implemented in in Hall two, uh, where they have simulated on the 
IA Tindic or Turbine and compared with CFD uh, lifting line and uh, and uh, yeah and then uh, there's improved uh, uh, code with uh, combination uh, with them and water cylinder and uh, one can see that this uh, uh, new uh, uh, code uh, it uh, fits quite well to the uh, to the uh, to the lifting line and also the uh, the CFD with this uh, considerable variation uh, along the radius of the blade. It's the offset compared with a non uh, cone or, or non planner uh, with a planner rotor. What we see here is this difference to a planner rotor. Yeah, in summary of the background, uh, uh, we can conclude that the BEM codes are uh, dominant in the elastic codes uh, used in industry for design and uh, certification. But that this uh, BEM accuracy is challenged by uh, different effects uh, that come from upscaling. And also that considerable research activities are ongoing in order to improve uh, BEM or even replace uh, the BEM as we just saw with the last slide. So the present uh, 2D uh, actuator disk model uh, development has to be seen on this background. And uh, we go to the uh, development of this uh, model. Uh, and what is the origin of the model? Uh, then we have to take a jump back in time down to the back to the uh, about 1980 and the uh, it has some uh, relation to the expansion of this uh, actuator disk concept to a general actuator surface yeah of arbitrary shape and why uh, do this uh, come up uh, back in uh, the 80s uh, and 70s uh, we saw uh, that uh, the vertical axis turbines were modeled by representation of the plane actuator disk. And this clearly has some uh, problems as uh, the uh, blade forces are out here on a circular path where the actuator disk uh, is plane. And so the computation of the induction uh, is uh, performed on a uh, an other position where you have the uh, the blade pass. So a uh, uh, solution to this is that uh, to say that the actuator has to coincide with the blade pass. So in general, that uh, the actuator surface should coincide with the swept area of the actual turbine type. Like if it's a cone road or if it's a yeah, out of uh, plane bending uh, uh, blades. So for a straight bladed vertical axis turbine, this is the uh, actuator cylinder. But uh, then we come, uh, can ask what, what uh, how, how should we compute the flow field as such uh, around the actuator surface? And uh, because we cannot just use the momentum theory on integral form, so the flow problem is that uh, for computing the flow around the uh, actuator surface, that we have uh, specified body forces in the flow on this uh, actuator surface. And uh, yeah, in the present case, we will only consider uh, body forces that are perpendicular to the surface. And then we have to solve for the flow field and there, I've been following the, the general method of von Kármán and Burgers. Uh, they operate with yeah uh, body forces on the flow field, uh, for example, for to compute uh, the flow for uh, wings of finite uh, span. But uh, this general method has been uh, more specific, used by Koning to simulate on an uh, uh, axisymmetric actuator disk. So it's these two. Uh, uh, a process that we will use in uh, in the setting up the equation and, and for the solution of the equations. Um, so we have the Euler equation uh, up here, and now we operate in, in, in 2D. 
And we have the body forces uh, and it's a, a steady version of the Euler equations. And then we have the equation of continuity. And then we write the uh, velocity components in this way that we have a perturbation, uh, Wx and Wy. And then we have a, a main onset flow, uh, a uniform flow. And then we first non-dimensionalize non uh, with the free stream velocity and uh, uh, and the um, pressure with uh, rho v squared and also the uh, body forces are non-dimensionalized. And if we do that and rearranging, then we get the system over here. And uh, we can see that the non-linear terms are on the right-hand side and it's we call them uh, induced body forces. Uh, and they are important when we have to make the interpretation of the linear uh, solution. But further uh, uh, rearranging, we come up with the uh, pressure uh, in the uh, Poisson uh, equation uh, in this way here. And the solution is that uh, for this can be worked out to be uh, these uh, double integrals here. And we can see that we now have split the solution into the linear part being a function of the applied uh, loading on the uh, actuator surface, and then uh, the pressure part being a function of the induced uh, body forces. And, uh, and uh, it's an important step that we now have split up the solution in, into a linear part and uh, a non-linear part. And uh, we will now apply this method to the uh, 2D actuator disk and focus on the linear solution. Uh, so now we have uh, the, the 2D. Uh, let's see, where is my cursor? Oh, sorry. Let it come here. Yeah. Uh, we have the 2D actuator disk and the, uh, 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 the coordinate system as shown here. And uh, now this uh, Poisson equation goes to a Laplace equation because it just has to fulfill that we uh, have a pressure jump over the, the disk. And this uh, pressure jump is related to the uh, body forces in, in during this uh, integral. So they have, have an infinite high intensity, but acting over a uh, very short uh, uh, infinite sin uh, uh, distance. And um, this uh, solution to, to this system can be done by uh, uh, um, covering the disk with duplets of the strength uh, delta p uh, and uh, based on the this integral here, which we then can solve and come up with the pressure uh, expressed in this way. And then we can integrate for the velocities as uh, shown here, integrate from minus infinity to x, which gives us expression for, for the wx uh, component and uh, this down here for the lateral uh, uh, velocity induced uh, component. Uh, and then we can apply this uh, solution uh, to uh, to a uniform loading, and we will compare with uh, CFD uh, actuator disk uh, simulations. Uh, but when we have a, a constant uh, 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 pressure variation as function of the uh, along the disk. Then we can integrate the integrals we saw just before up here. And uh, then we get this expression for the pressure and the for the two velocity components uh, down here. And again, uh, yeah, the uh, x and y are non-dimensional with the half width of the uh, actuator disk. And as before, your uh, components also non-dimensionalized. So now we show uh, a computation for trust coefficient of 0.4, uh, 
And what we see here is the axial velocity profiles from upstream the disk to downstream. And uh, at the disk, we have the green curve here, and we see a constant velocity distribution. And we compare with the momentum theory, which we can see gives a slightly higher induction. And down in the far wake, again, the uh, momentum theory uh, is, uh, gives a constant velocity uh, distribution, and the same does the model here. Uh, in between, we can see some nonlinear profiles, which I will come back to. Over here are the lateral is the lateral velocity component, which uh, is peaking uh, here at the edge of the disk, um, where it's in fact is uh, uh, in, infinite. But um, we saw that uh, up here that we don't well, we compute a slightly less induction than on the momentum series. And we can show that we have to increase the trust coefficient for the 2D uh, actuator disk model in this way, where CT is the uh, CT from the momentum theory. And when we do this, we now uh, get the, the coincide the uh, velocity profiles at the disk and also almost in, in the wake. We see the expansion of the momentum theory, but we don't have expansion in this uh, 2D, uh, the analytical 2D model. Uh, and then we can ask, why do we have to scale up the uh, loading, the trust coefficient on, on this, uh, in this uh, uh, linear model? Yeah, it's uh, due to the uh, body forces. I mean, what we have solved in the linear uh, uh, version is the, uh, the the, the gray shaded uh, part here, but when we have solved that, we then we can compute the uh, the induced uh, body forces, and so we say the 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 full solution is uh, the system here, both the gray and the green one, where we have to consider the these uh, induced body forces as external body forces, and uh, the action of it is. Uh, Right clear here, where we see the uh, enclosing streamline around the disk. At the disk, we saw the the constant uh, profile of uh, fitting the momentum series, but then we can see that, yeah, the the uh, the streamlines expand, and then we can see that part of uh, the flow passing through the disk uh, with reduced uh, velocity are uh, accelerated up to to the full. Uh, free stream velocity out here in this part of the wake. So it's due to the action of these uh, body forces that in the case here uh, are acting along uh, y equals to one and, and minus one. So they simply draw increased flow through the disk and in that way we have to counteract this with, with an increased uh, loading. So in the case here, 0.89, uh, for the trust coefficient in the momentum theory, we have to increase this uh, trust coefficient to 1.34 in the linear uh, Twitter disk model. And um, then uh, an important flow characteristic uh, of this uh, 2D uh, analytical model, uh, where we saw here a comparison with uh, uh, and simulation with CFD on the same case. Um, the black uh, line here is the uh, velocity uh, at the disk, which we can see as we notice in the beginning of presentation that we have less induction for uniform loading on the uh, central part or inboard part and higher induction on the outboard part. But then when we look at the velocity profiles from this, uh, uh, analytical uh, uh, model, we can see that they immediately downstream the disk starts to uh, to be curved, and uh, far downstream they become uh, a uniform again. So there is a region here just behind the disk where they uh, have a strong development to a nonlinear shape, 
and uh, we have made a zoom over here. And if we take this purple uh, profile, which is taken out 8% uh, downstream the disk, and then scale simply the velocity with 5% uh, up 1.05, we can see that this uh, profile simply fits the full nonlinear solution. So, so it's an interesting uh, characteristic that by extracting the velocities in the uh, analytical model uh, a little bit downstream of the disk, we can get uh, velocity profiles that uh, fit a full uh, nonlinear solution. And why is why is why is it so? Um, these uh, body forces they start to act and and has the highest intensity here just at the edge of the disk, and then they decrease uh, downstream here and become zero in the in the wake of our Ella, just downstream. So it seems that when we take out these uh, velocity profiles, where we have action of the body forces upstream and downstream, that yeah, that they somewhat cancel the effect of each other, so we get a velocity profile uh, that is uh, uh, correlate quite well with a, a full uh, actuator disk simulation. Then for uh, the solution for uh, a yacht disk, uh, where we express the uh, in the new coordinate system of the yacht uh, uh, disk in this way, and then insert these uh, coordinates in the original uh, uh, expression for wx and wy. We get these expressions for for the velocity comment for for the yacht uh, disk. And uh, now again, we will compare with uh, uh, CFD, and in this case, uh, it is a three D CFD simulation uh, on on an actuator disk. For the analytical model, we show over here the uh, uh, the case with the disk yacht thirty degree, and we show the uh, enclosing streamlines and can notice that, of course, hello, we, we see a deflection of the uh, wake flow as we would expect. And uh, to be consistent, we extract then the velocity uh, along this line, 8% uh, downstream the, the disk. And uh, it's what we are showing over here and, and compare with the uh, simulations of the, uh, with the CFD and which is the black one, and uh, this uh, scaled up is the uh, circles uh, purple, and we can see the a quite quite good correlation uh, up here, and uh, there's some smaller deviations on the part down here, which probably is due to the higher lateral velocity that a uh, that a two D model will will show compared with an axisymmetric model, but. In general, uh, a quite close uh, correlation with the 3D CFD uh, simulation. Next, uh, uh, we will show the modeling of a cone disk, and it's done by superposition of two opposite yacht disks. Here we see uh, two disks with uh, minus and the, the 30 degree yaw and plus 30 degree yaw here in some distance, uh, but then we approach them so they just uh, touch uh, each other at the edge here, and then we have a simulation of a, a, a cone disk here with a double size and a single uh, yaw disks. And um, now again, we will compare with uh, CFD uh, simulations uh, for a 20 degree cone disk. And in this case, it's uh, axisymmetric uh, CFD uh, simulations. And uh, again, the uh, enclosing streamlines uh, showed over here. And again, we extract the velocity along this uh, green line. And uh, when we do that and then scale up as before, uh, then we uh, 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 then we get the correlation as shown here with the test blue line in comparison with the uh, black line from the CFD simulations. So this shape uh, is uh, correlated quite well with the uh, CFD uh, results, uh, but a small underestimation of the 
of this uh, overestimation of the uh, induction, so we are slightly below. But otherwise, a very good uh, correlation. We do the same for an upwind uh, cone disk, um, and we can notice that this uh, normal velocity to the disk is quite different from downwind coning to upwind coning. We get this uh, uh, very nonlinear uh, shape of the uh, normal velocity distribution out here. Uh, and again, now we have a somewhat bigger deviation between the CFD results and the uh, analytical results from the 2D model. Uh, but the shape is uh, uh, quite close to, to the full CFD so, uh, solution. Then we show here a uh, simulation with the model of uh, cone angles from 60 to minus 60 degree over here from zero to 60 degree. Um, and we can see that yeah, the coning has a, a big impact on the uh, velocity profiles. They, we get a bigger and bigger difference from the normal velocity at the center to, to the uh, edge of the, the disk. Over here from zero to, to minus 60 degree, I mean, uh, upwind coning, and we can see this uh, special uh, velocity distribution here at the edge, uh, which disappear when we think we have cone angles of uh, about minus 30, 40 degree, uh, then they disappear. Um, yeah, this. Uh, Slide here to just illustrate the complexity of the uh, uh, cone disk flow. And what we illustrate is the induction contributions to disk one, which is uh, the lower part of the, the cone disk. So we show here how, yeah, what contributions are to, to the induction on, on, on this part of the disk. So we have the, here's the axial velocity component. We have the induction from the from the disk itself here, but then we have the induction coming from the upper part of the cone disk, and then we get the uh, the total, which is the the blue one. So you can see that is a considerable uh, uh, part from the uh, higher part of the disk here, and if here we show the same for the uh, lateral velocity components. Um, where we have the uh, the one here from the disk itself, and then the uh, lateral component from the other side, and uh, we see that it uh, uh, the velocity should be zero here at the center as it is, but uh, uh, it has a big contribution from both disks. Uh, disks. So one could say to to make a one point. Uh, uh, um, Approximation for the influ influence of uh, coning uh, seems to be challenging, at least also taking into account that the load could uh, vary uh, from the one side to the other side. And now to the numerical implementation uh, of the model for arbitrary disk shape and, and loading. Um, first here, just uh, an example for illustration. Uh, and we show here how we can simulate a, a yaw disk, a, a straight plane disk, and a, a non-planar disk. And we are doing this with uh, with uh, four uh, individual yaw uh, disk with uh, uniform loading uh, up here, and uh, the same down here, and then we at a dummy disk out here, which has no loading, just to be able with the same uh, model to, to compute the uh, induction. And uh, over here, this, uh, the axial velocity along the, the disks are shown. And again, we see that it has a, a big impact from going from a, a plane disk to a non-plane uh, disk. But we... Uh, this was for illustration. Now we go to a more realistic uh, case where we now use uh, 80 uh, uh, small uh, yard disks to, to, uh, to generate this uh, 
uh, disk shape here, the, the blue one. Uh, and then we have the dummy disks out here again to be able to compute the, uh, the flow. And over here, we have the axial velocity then uh, along the this uh, curved disk, the green, like the red one from, from the 2D uh, Twitter disk model, and the green one is the momentum theory. So we can see that we can generate a completely smooth uh, curve by uh, superposition of uh, these uh, elementary uh, yaw disk with uh, uniform uh, loading. And uh, here we then demonstrate uh, how we can uh, model uh, 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 load variation of the disk uh, here, just a stepwise change in loading from one part to the other with the highest loading uh, on the upper part and the lower loading here. And uh, again, the uh, actual uh, velocities uh, over here, uh, the red curve from the 2D actuator disk model and we and then the green one, the momentum theory. And I think we see some interesting uh, uh, effect uh, of the model that from this uh, uh, high loaded part over here, that there is a, a, a flow that is uh, moved to this uh, lower uh, loaded uh, part. So we see an increasing axial velocity here in the uh, region. Uh, just uh, here, a uh, uh, plain disk with uh, also stepwise change in loading. And uh, also here we see that because we extract the velocities 8% downstream of the disk, we see a, a full interaction of the, most of the disk uh, with this uh, step in change in load, which is not uh, felt or seen in the momentum theory. And then uh, finally, uh, one slide on how the model could be implemented as a rotor induction model. Uh, in HOG2, uh, the BEM model is implemented on a non-rotating grid where we update the induction in each uh, grid point at uh, each uh, time step. Then put these uh, inductions to uh, 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 a low-pass filter uh, uh, to uh, to simulate uh, the yeah the dynamic induction. So in the case with the model here, we would uh, apply it along a diagonal line and compute the uh, induction at the at the grid points. And uh, this uh, then of course the shape of the disk should uh, be the actual the shape of the rotor along this uh, line, which was, would be a combined combination of the yaw and tilt of the rotor and the coning and uh, uh, also deflection. So we the input would be this uh, the torsion coefficient and the, the tangential uh, load coefficient uh, CQ. And this, they can be derived from the blade element uh, analysis in, in the normal way here for the torsion coefficient and over here for the uh, uh, tangential load uh, coefficient. And um, and for the tangential induction, you simply use this uh, uh, tangential loading coefficient and uh, uh, insert in, in the equation here, then we have the tangential uh, uh, induction. So uh, uh, compressed and, and uh, uh, with a, a few uh, 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 expression to to implement in 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 a model. Yeah, and to the conclusions, uh, we have shown that uh, we have this uh, analytical linear uh, solution for a two D actuator disk with uniform loading, and uh, by scaling uh, the loading uh, and also the velocities and extracting the velocity 8% downstream the disk, we find a very good correlation to the normal velocity distribution by a, a full nonlinear code uh, like the CFD simulations. And this is for aligned flow, but also yard flow and, uh, and also for the cone uh, disk. 
And I think this uh, the the a two D model has some advantages compared with an axis symmetric model, uh, as we have seen that we can uh, model uh, uh, quite uh, non symmetric shapes that might be uh, uh, yeah that might not be uh, axis symmetric and. Uh, also, that we can simulate uh, arbitrary uh, loading uh, along uh, along a diagonal uh, line, and also to say a yard, a cone disk in your can also be simulated with the model, and uh, and yeah, we have shown how to uh, implement the, the model for uh, rotor uh, induction model. Yes, thank you for your participation, uh, and uh, yeah. I hope it uh, gave some new input. Thank you very much, Helia, and also thank you for keeping the, the time very nicely. So uh, very interesting. You use publications spanning the last uh, almost 90 years in your presentation, which is quite unusual. So um, are there any questions to Helia? You can either just take the word or write in the chat. Yeah. So, uh, you, 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 at some point, you um, yeah, multiply by this factor 1.05. Is that an empirical correction or is it? Uh, Something no, right. it it is to 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 fit the uh, the CFD simulations, but but it's because we extract the uh, this velocity eight percent downstream the disk, and it's uh, clear that the velocity it uh, decreases as function of the downstream position of the disk. So it's quite natural that it has. You know, of course, it has to be increased to. To fit a velocity at the disk, so uh, but but uh, yeah, one can. It's a one point oh five we have used uh, also for the cone and for the yacht disk, and you might see that maybe for the the coning it did not uh, uh, or another uh, different uh, slightly different coefficient might have been better, but yes. but um, but it, it's clear that we have to. To multiply with some coefficient uh, when we extract the velocities uh, downstream. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Then, um, Hi, um, yeah. this is Tobin. Tobin. I just wonder if it was possible to make some experiments in a big wind tunnel with a real turbine or even in the outside environment to s compare with your predictions of this model? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but uh, I mean, um, it's probably more difficult with uh, experiments uh, than with uh, higher fidelity codes. Um, uh, I mean, how to make experiments with actual disk. I mean, of course you have, um, have different uh, uh, ways of doing it in in a wind tunnel. So yeah, so it uh, it might be uh, possible to represent an actual actuator disk with uh, some uh, uh, what's called permeable uh, um, uh, disk that allows the uh, flow par uh, partly to pass through. But what about using a real turbine with three blades? I mean, isn't that what you are? Going yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's uh, where it should really be uh, tested by implementing in a in a elastic code, and uh, then compare with different type of measurements that we have uh, on on full scale turbines. Yeah, but I mean, the first uh, easy uh, or best uh, way of uh, of uh, validating is by comparison with a higher fidelity codes, uh, both disk simulations, but also uh, uh, but also uh, <clears throat> uh, full uh, result uh, uh, rotor simulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
more questions? Anyone? Um, um, hello. Um, yeah, my name is Anna Yafnas. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, really interesting also to me because uh, I've been working on um, improving uh, the um, uh, using Rotex cylinder uh, for past uh, few years or more. And uh, yeah, my question uh, is um, in general, so it seems to me that uh, this model is also at the end uh, dependent uh, on the uh, um, load coefficients, I mean, uh, the um, lift and drag coefficients for uh, the plates. And um, uh, actually, my finding was that uh, basically these coefficients are sometimes very really dependent on the local code base uh, reliance number and uh, can impact the solution a lot. Uh, so, um, so do you have any um, like recommendations? How can we this took into account uh, the impact of this uh, coefficient? So, because if they are not correct, uh, if they are like deviate from the reality, then also the prediction is. Uh, Sometimes very not not correct. Thank you. Uh, was it uh, on the uh, CFD simulations or uh, with the Reynolds number effect? Or I didn't completely catch it. Uh, I mean, uh, the input in the model, as I understood at the end, it's uh, still the uh, trust coefficient, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the trust coefficient, we will calculate it uh, using the local uh, uh, lift and drag coefficients. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I mean, this uh, lift and drag coefficient for different airfoils yeah. are yeah. also dependent on the local quad base surveillance number, right? Oh, yeah, it's uh, correct. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's what we are doing standard in, uh, in the BIM series. So, the, it's the uh, Blade elements part where we compute the uh, forces from the blade sections, which then we derive to a choice coefficient, which then is the input to the model. But this is then the same as uh, yeah as we are doing in, in BIM and also some of the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the the vortex codes uh, where you use uh, airflow data. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, I was wondering if um, now you have inhomogeneous loading and, and yaw and, and so on. Can you also, also do inhomogeneous inflow? So the inflow is all the time. Yeah. Yeah. The same. But, uh... It's as uh, it would be done in the same way as we are doing now with this uh, grid implementation, where we evaluate the induction in, in the grid points with the local uh, flow conditions, so the actual free stream uh, velocity. Uh, so uh, yeah, so it would be it would be the same. So it's uh, very important to to implement it for uh, induction in uh, in the turbulent. Uh, inflow and, and done in this way we see uh, that the spectra of the induced velocities are have the same peaks as uh, uh, incoming velocity with one to one higher peaks so so uh, and it's a development of these uh, elastic codes or the BIM implementation from years back where it was not necessary because we didn't see so big variation of flow over the rotor disk but this is uh, important certainly now for the 200 meter rotor. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any last question? Okay. But uh, thank you, everyone from all over the world, even uh, Korea, uh, joining the seminar and. Uh, I'm looking forward to see you next month if we get a speaker for that. Otherwise, uh, we have a presentation in January where Elliot Simon from DTU is presenting the GLOBE experiment. So thank you very much, everyone, and a special thank you to Helia for his uh, presentation. So, okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. <clears throat>